what I'm going to talk about really fits in very well with what Jean and Danielle mentioned in a sense of you've got a clear view of the sort of perspective and how this fits into the European agenda. Danielle gave a very good indication of some of the practicalities of what's being looked at at a European level. What I'd like to talk about particularly is the specifics of the SEM and the specific challenges we have in Ireland. And the way our model has evolved in Ireland doesn't necessarily fit easily within the changes that are coming. And part of the challenge that we have is to try and to, to make sure that we can get that integration and that we can continue to lead in, as part of the sort of the European integration process. And maybe just to go back to the history, I mean, the SEM, the single electricity market, started back in 2007. It was one of the first markets in Europe between ourselves and the Iberian Peninsula. The two of us were in competition to see who could bring two markets together first. I think they beat us by a month or two, but the... the um, the idea of the single electricity market is a complete integration. This is not just about market coupling. The single electricity market has <coughs> common governance right the way through to common regulation. We have a committee that make decisions jointly together. We have Alan Rainey here from the committee today. Um, and we make those decisions jointly so that the market is completely coupled. It's not, uh, there's no sense of, of separation. The decisions are made jointly across the island. The challenges for us, though, is the design that we had, and I'll go back a little to talk about some of the design elements. The design was specifically for the features of this island and the challenges we have on this island and doesn't easily fit within the sort of the target model. And this is where uh, our consultation that's out at the moment is, is so critical. Um, one of the, if we look back now against where we were in 2007, we've had major new investments. Um, both in, in renewables and in wind, and are, are, we're well on target for, for meeting the sort of 2020 targets, notwithstanding sort of challenges that have arisen very recently. The major challenges clear in the networks. We, we've seen the north-south as a binding constraint. It's costing something like 20 million per annum in, in cost to consumers not having the north-south built. Originally, we thought it would be built a lot earlier. There's still <coughs> challenges there. <coughs> And the public perception, the public acceptance of networks is a, is a major issue, as it will be for interconnectors. I think the, the interconnector project here in Ireland is, has shown that things can be delivered relatively quickly, but it takes an awful lot of effort and political capital to make sure that's delivered. So let me just talk a bit about the, the SEM and how this fits in. First, in terms of structure, the ACER board and the CER is one of, of 27 member states who make decisions at, at a common regulatory board across Europe. They translated the directive into a set of framework guidelines. Those framework guidelines then are taken by NCOE and turned into a set of network codes. The framework guidelines recognised when we were sitting down and talking to our, our other re our regulators across Europe that the Irish market and the, the single electricity market is quite different to the structure of other markets across Europe. So there was an acceptance that the 2014 date in Ireland, or for this island, would be a transitional date and final completion would be 2016. And we're very um, grateful to our fellow regulators for, uh, for understanding um, the difficulties and challenges that we have specifically. One of the other things I might just talk about is who are we connecting to? And you hear from Alison about sort of, you know, what's happening in the GB market. We're very conscious that there's fairly radical changes going on within GB. The energy market reform, while it's not a change of the structure itself, it's a, uh, of the electricity market, there's a number of major pieces that sit on top of that that will have a, a big effect on the development of the market. So you have a new capacity type mechanism coming in a feed-in tariff change in terms of the way renewables are, are supported. <coughs> You've got um, uh, uh, energy, um, emissions performance standards brought in for generators. Um, and you've also got a carbon floor, which is a change in the, in the way carbon is priced in the market. So those are major changes in terms of the way the GB market is going to develop. And it also will have an impact on our own market. We just need to be careful of that as part of the development of the, of the, of the SEM into an integrated market. It's also worth noting that, that in GB there's quite a lot of discussion about the beta market, which has been up and running for quite a while, and a recognition that there's limitations, particularly in liquidity in that market, and, and that will need to be to reviewed and, and, and changed um, over time. So let me just, some of these slides um, will actually link in very closely with what Daniel's done already. 
Um, a key thing, I suppose, from, from our point of view is this consultation is effectively about the future of the market in the, on this island. We've allowed three months in order that there's enough time for people to engage in the process. But if there's one message you would like you to take away from today, which is there's over 100 pages in that document where we've tried to set out the full thinking. There's a lot of detail here. We can't cover anything like in such a short period of time. But that document tries to capture all that detail. But we're coming to this from a regulatory point of view with an open mind. We don't have a, you know, a clear, firm view that there will be a, a market Y coming out of this from, from the market that we have. We, we're looking to the industry, to stakeholders, to anyone who's interested to make sure that you get involved early. There's no point in telling us after we've made the decision, oh, we don't like that decision, we would have liked to have done something else. It doesn't help us at all. So early engagement with this consultation process. We have three months, so there's plenty of time for people to get involved, but please try and invest time in it because your investment will be an investment in, in the future of this market. As, as we did, the consultation goes through, it looks at the disparity, and I'll talk a little about what the differences between our market and the, uh, and the, the sort of the standard European model um, and how we need to change our market. We talk about some of the features of why SEM developed the way it did. There's issues of market power. There's issues of the fact that generators in Ireland are actually quite large compared to the overall demand. So the process by which you decide to commit generators in a very large market where each of the generators are quite small, it's easy to do on price alone um, without looking at startup costs, no load costs. In the Irish market, they are a, a key component of the market. So this concept, which is called unit commitment, this process of unit commitment is actually a major issue in a small market like Ireland and is made more challenging with renewables. And you've heard from Danielle about the variability. And this variability is something we're seeing probably ahead of most countries in Europe just because of the, of, of the size and the level of renewables that we have already. And to some extent, this is our opportunity as well as a challenge. Our opportunity to try and solve the variability issue here in Ireland. And it's not just about more flexible generation. It's also about trying to get demand participation. This is where the whole process of smart meters, smart grids, we need to try and change the paradigm for how the system is operated. And this is a challenge that's going to be seen in, in many countries. I think Spain is also seeing some of these challenges earlier. But between Spain, Ireland, we're one of the few nations internationally that are seeing this level of renewables and the challenge of integrating renewables. But there's a great opportunity from an innovation point of view, from new stimulating new industry, finding cost-effective solutions for, for solving that. This you've seen um, for the, uh, at a European level, that's my, my second slide, Daniel. But the, the first slide here is just to talk about the differences on, on the, and the similarities between the Irish market and the common European model. The first piece, the blue piece on the left-hand side, is fairly similar. We have um, interconnectors traded. At the, at the moment, that's one interconnector, Moyle, connecting with GB. We'll have the east-west in September. Um, it's good to hear again that it's going to be in September. I'm glad to, to hear there'll be no delay. Um, but certainly, th and, and those at the moment are done by way of contracts. We also have a set of um, financial contracts, CFDs, and they very much set the price in the retail market. So any retailer going in to sell electricity will be uh, very dependent on those medium to long term contracts, typically sort of annual or, or part annual contracts. But we don't have a day ahead market. We have an, intra, an intraday market arriving at the end of this year uh, as, a, as a result of, of changes in the code that will give us a number of gate closures rather than one gate closure, but it, that intraday market isn't there at the moment. The balancing mechanism is very much a purely TSO issue, and the TSO will actually dispatch the system based on what it can dispatch, which may look quite different to the market schedule, which was done on the, on the assumption that there is no network constraints. And the difference between them results in these very high costs to consumers, constraint payments. And I'd mentioned earlier about this 20 million per annum for the, the, the north-south being late. That's an example of these constraint payments, inefficiencies from actual dispatch based on what should happen if the market was perfect. And the final thing, which is a key part of what we're going to have to change, is in the Irish market, the price for electricity <coughs> is not known until something like three days after the market has closed. Now, quite clearly, this is totally different to the, the um, framework guidelines where it's an ex-ante market and the price is known in advance. 
So that's one of the, the, the key areas that will have to change our current market. This is, is a copy to some extent of the slide that Daniel did, so I'll, I'll fly through that, but it's again just showing where the, so the common European market's going. This is another copy of your slide as well. <laughs> I think it might have an earlier version. I don't have as much coupling as you do, but um, you can see the various markets and the development of the markets. I think it's worth noting though that because we have uh, we have a mandatory pool system. It's very similar to the, uh, the system that was in Great Britain um, until about 2001 before NITA and then it was, became BETA. Um, but it, it's, a, it's a mandatory pool, so every generator in the system must sell into the pool. They have no choice above 10 megawatts. That is done on a marginal basis. It's centrally dispatched, and that sets the price every half hour. That price then is the price that are paid by suppliers, and again, they must purchase from the pool. So this design, which is quite common sort of in the US, and obviously we started off in Great Britain, is very different to the types of markets across the rest of Europe. Most of the European markets are a bilateral market, where generators and suppliers contract with each other, and then there's a balancing arrangement that sits around that. So the, the challenge, I suppose, at all of this is to bring this all together and to try and get it all up and, up and running by 2014. Um, there's a couple of other areas maybe, maybe I'll talk about. This unit commitment and dispatch. There's a question in the Irish market about is this central unit commitment a key feature of the Irish market? Can we change it? Can we move to the alternative? And the alternative is a self-commitment. Each generator decides how they want to run, how they want to, to, to bid in. And part of this relates to the structure of the bids that they make into the market. In our market, in the, the single electricity market, it's what's called a complex bid. So people bid in not just the cost to run, but also the cost to start up and the cost to run at no load, i.e. to be there but not to be generating. Um, in, in, a in, a, in a, a central or a simple market, what the, the bids are are simple bids where there's just a single price put in and it doesn't define the, the, the start up and no load costs as separate. Now, the design was quite helpful, one, for unit commitment, and two, also to ensure that those bids are accurate. We have a very tightly managed market. The, the bid from each generator is actually controlled by the regulator, and there's a market monitoring unit, and it's, there's a requirement in our current market that they must bid in short or marginal cost, i.e. the running costs. And the, the recovery of fixed costs come from a capacity payment. Again, if we go back to the other markets, the capacity payment has been fudged a little in the terms of the sort of the central design. There's some discussion about capacity coming in in GB, but it's an integral part of the Irish market. Um, there was quite a bit of debate at the time when the, when the SEM was being designed. Do you have volatile prices, so the spot price can raise to very high prices at a time of shortfall, or do you have a capacity payment and, and a sort of a less volatile uh, energy price? The decision at the time of the SEM was that we would go for the go for the ladder. But these questions are now back in the fray. This consultation raises some of these questions again, and there's an element of going back and, and having a relook at, at the primary design principles. I've given you a table here, and I don't intend to go through the sort of the, the various aspects of this table, but to note this idea of the ex ante versus the ex post, it's, it's quite a major change in the market, the market design. We'll also have to look at the cost of centralized systems, there's a cost of market participant systems. All of these will need to change dependent on the level of, of, of radical change that we make in the market. Again, this sort of describes this pool that I mentioned earlier on where there's a mandatory pool where everyone sells into a, 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 a common pool. Just to dimension this for the Irish system, we're talking about just over 2 billion euro per annum feed through this pool system. So even for a relatively small market like Ireland, you can see we're talking about large amounts of money. So the systems that need to be in place here need to be extremely robust. They need to, you know, the, any chance of that failing and large amounts of money being lost would be, you know, inconstable. So it, it's critical that, that these structures and the systems are robust and that they're not, you know, you know that they will be very unlikely to fail. Um, and as you can see, that's the, 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 the new market design or, uh, uh, in terms of a European level is on the right-hand side. This is just a, a list of countries that have the, the sort of the self-commitment versus the central commitment. 
I won't again go through them all, but I think it's generally fair, fair to say that all the centralized ones are in the US, bar Ireland and, and the island of Ireland, and most of them at a European <coughs> level are, are self-commitment. Um, some of these issues I've already talked about in terms of the, the development of the market. I think it's worth just maybe talking about wind and the integration of wind in the market as well. It's quite important with, a, with, an, with the current system, and maybe I just go back to this statistic because I think it brings it home. At the moment, the Irish system is already seeing, in a given half hour, 50% of energy from wind. So, you know, the, this shows that, you know, when you're at a 15, 20% on, a, on an annual average, we're hitting the 50% in real time. At the moment, the 50% is a limit. The grid operator says, right, we're at 50%, we can't go beyond that. That's causing curtailment of generators, which means that even though the wind's blowing, even though that the, the, the wind generator is available, that wind generator is being told to turn down or, or turn off which is obviously has a, a negative effect for, from them from a financing point of view and to the consumer is a cost. Why pay for something and you get nothing for it? So resolving that is a, is a key challenge. There's a project being in place at the moment by the TSOs to try and resolve this to move from the 50% to the 75%. The timing on that is, is very important. Interconnectors help. And Daniel, you mentioned about interconnectors and the benefit. An interconnector, when there's a high level of wind and low demand, you get low prices. And at low prices, you should be exporting. If you're exporting, you increase the demand, and therefore the problem goes away. So it has a major effect also on the on efficient use, because it's extremely inefficient to have wind generators and not be using them properly. So the, the, the design of the market has an effect on, on many different areas uh, in terms of the efficiency of the system generally. Um, and maybe I'll just finally um, finish up on the last, oh, sorry, interconnection. I think it's worth mentioning about the, the opportunities in Ireland for future interconnection. I suppose it, uh, if we exclude Iceland, I think the, the, the options for us are, do we connect further to the, the Great, Great Britain market or do we connect to France? I think some of the challenges in a small system like Ireland, the cost of interconnectors are a relatively large cost. And I think there's a debate to be had about who pays for interconnectors. Do both ends of the interconnector pay or does only one end of the interconnector pay? And I just throw that out for discussion, but I think it's a, a useful one maybe to think about. I think there's also a question of diversity. If we're closely coupled to the GB market, if the wind profile in Ireland is very similar to the wind profile in GB, is there a sort of a diversity benefit by say connecting to France? But of course it's longer and further away, so there's extra cost. And, and if that's something, I know that Airgrid are, are doing some studies on this, and it'll be great to, to see more of that before final decisions are made. Um, and in conclusion, I suppose if I give you one conclusion, there's a consultation out there last week. Please read that consultation. Try and understand the issues that are somewhat difficult and can be quite technical, but the implications they will have for this market are profound. And if you engage early, we've, we're coming to this with an open mind, we genuinely don't have a view of how it will be done. We'd like it to be low cost. We'd like it to be low cost to the consumer. We'd like it to be efficient. We'd like it to be investment friendly. But beyond those sort of general presumptions, we're quite open in terms of the way it will be done. And we're keen to hear everyone's view on it. Thanks very much. Thank you.